Well, today we get to study God's Word again as we come to this portion of the worship service when after we have given our praise and thanks to God for what He's done, we are now at a time when we are ready to listen to what God has to say to us through His Word. But before we look into Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah once again today, let me just uh, make an observation that long-distance runners, particularly marathoners, are an awfully curious lot. Generally, they're brave, and they're motivated, they're disciplined, they're skinny, <laughs> and, and they're masochistic. We have a few of them here in our VCG family, and I want to say this morning that I really admire you, but I don't understand you. <laughs> Marathon runners understand more than any of us what it means to hit the wall and to fight through it. They know that when you first start the race, that running is a pleasure. It's, it's fun. Boy, you begin that race and your body is energized and your mind is clear. Your legs are moving quickly and lightly. Your heart and your lungs are functioning at maximum capacity. The birds are singing, the sun is shining, and you are at one with the cosmos. And how long this pleasure stage lasts depends on the runner's conditioning, which for me lasts about 250 feet. Now, after this initial rush of practically effortless pleasure, running starts to become hard work. And if you keep going long enough, you reach the point where the temptation to stop is powerful and relentless, almost overwhelming. Your legs get heavy and protest every stride. Your heart is pounding and your lungs are burning. Your mind is mushy. Your body is screaming at you to quit. And runners call this torturous experience hitting the wall. To run at this stage, to hit the wall and to keep going is the ultimate test of a runner. Races are won or lost. Races are completed or abandoned at the wall. And finishing the race well after hitting the wall, well, that's what counts. And it's not just true of long distance runners. Not only do they hit the wall, but others do too. We all do. Life and ministry is also a marathon. And in the race of life and in the course of ministry, followers of Jesus are likely at times to hit the wall, to feel like giving up. Those who live for God and join him in the work of rebuilding what's broken should expect at some point to hit the wall. And to hit the wall and keep going, well, that's the ultimate test of God's people. Finishing and finishing well, that's what really matters. This morning we come to the point in the story of Nehemiah where his crew of wall builders hit the wall. When we last looked at this Old Testament story of God's people rebuilding the city walls of Jerusalem, their grand construction project had only just begun. Nehemiah had successfully mobilized and he had energized and he had organized hundreds of laborers who were working together as an excellent team, each one doing their part with passion and diligence. And the broken down walls surrounding the holy city were rising again with impressive speed and strength. But now as we pick up the story, the wall project is about halfway done. And when you're rebuilding what's broken, halfway is a hard place. Notice Nehemiah's progress report in verses 6 and 10 in chapter 4. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. The first stage of the project had gone really smoothly. So far, even, th even though the work was, uh, well, it was rigorous, the builders remained vigorous. It was like the early stage of a race, and the workers, like fresh runners, they're still wholehearted in their enthusiasm and their effort. But just a few verses later, these wall builders at the halfway point hit the wall. Verse 10, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. And there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. I think we can all relate to their experience. Halfway is indeed a hard place. Halfway through, you're getting tired because you've already gone a ways. But you're only halfway through, and you still have a ways to go. Wednesday can be a particularly tough day to go to work because you're only halfway through the work week. Life itself can be challenging at the midway point as we humans experience sometimes a sense of uncertainty or anxiety about our identity and our purpose or our relationships and our accomplishments. 
which is why this, this is a phenomenon that is called midlife crisis. Halfway through a marriage, halfway through the child-rearing years, halfway through a do-it-yourself kitchen or bathroom renovation, halfway through a school or work project or a writing of a sermon, halfway through a ministry commitment, this is when we are prone to hit the wall and want to quit. I want to take a closer look this morning with you at verse 10 and analyze the internal battles that are triggered when we hit the wall. First, there is the fatigue factor. The simple reality is this, that we can get discouraged and we can want to quit rebuilding when we lose energy. We're more inclined to give up when our strength is giving out. And the Hebrew word here translated giving out conveys the idea of stumbling or faltering or staggering to the point of falling down. Ironically, the walls that these workers were building were standing steady. But the wall builders themselves were now unsteady. They were tottering. They were in danger of collapsing. Their initial burst of adrenaline and excitement has been depleted, and they're getting tired. In our 21st century world of hurry and scurry, I think we've become a society of tired husbands and wives, tired parents, tired employees and employers. The church is run by tired people, and most of the ministry and outreach of the church is done by tired volunteers. We are no strangers to fatigue, and therefore we're no stranger to discouragement. Now, secondly, there is the frustration factor. Our internal battle with discouragement that's triggered by our tiredness is exacerbated, exacerbated by all the unruly clutter in our lives and all around us. I think what made the work especially exhausting and frustrating for all those wall builders was the fact that there was so much rubble to deal with, all the junk that they had to clear away or refurbish. Have you noticed that rebuilding is much harder than building? And since we are fallen people living in a fallen world, we find ourselves constantly rebuilding what's broken in our lives and in this world. There is so much rubble in the lives of those we are ministering to, not to mention in our own lives as well. We're all in a mess. And in the messiness of our brokenness, we can easily get frustrated because, well, we can lose focus on our mission and begin to see only the obstacles. That's what happened here. Nehemiah's workers lost sight of how much wall they had already restored. And they began to fixate on the rubble that was still lying around. And so it is with us today. We get such tunnel vision on the problems, on the obstacles to our progress that we stop making progress. The urge to quit gets stronger and stronger when we stop focusing on the big rocks that are back in place as well as where we can put the next rock, and instead we start staring at the hundreds of rocks that are still hindering our pathway and contributing to the overall mess. What kind of rubble do you have to contend with in your life, in your marriage, in your family, or your career, or your ministry? There's so much of it, of course, but we need to train ourselves to look at how far we've already come rather than how far we have yet to go. And we need to train ourselves to stay focused on the noble goal of rebuilding what's broken rather than on the pesky obstacles of the rubble. I guess this is how you and I can avoid discouragement, keeping our eyes on the prize instead of all the gunk that's around us. But ha what happens when we get overwhelmed with fatigue and frustration? Well, we start to feel like failures who are involved in a rebuilding project that can't possibly succeed. Once we're tired and weary and get exasperated and preoccupied with the rubble that's in and around us, we can easily lose confidence and become pessimistic. Notice the gloomy conclusion that Nehemiah's wall builders came to when they reached the hard place of halfway. There is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Now their mission seems impossible. They were so excited at first, but now it seems more like a hopeless cause. Why should we go on? It can't be done. It's time to throw in the trowel. Nehemiah had his work cut out for him, to say the least at this point. Halfway through the project, he must re-energize a workforce that doesn't have much force behind it anymore. How do you replenish people who have lost their energy and lost their focus and have lost their confidence? How do you encourage rebuilders to stay on the wall after they have hit the wall? 
Well, Nehemiah is a brilliant leader and encourager, and we will take a look in a few moments at how he deals with fatigued, frustrated laborers who feel like failures. We know that this true story has a successful ending, the wall is going to be completely rebuilt by these wavering workers in just a matter of a few weeks. But first we must realize that things got even worse for them before they finished the product uh, and, and the project. Because not only did they face the internal battles of fatigue and frustration and these feelings of failure, but they were also facing and encountering some external battles as well. Because when you join God in rebuilding our broken world, mark it down, it is more than work. It's warfare. When you are building something for God, whether it's your moral character and your spiritual maturity, whether it's your financial peace, whether it's a godly marriage or a strong family or a fruitful ministry or a vibrant, attractive witness for Christ, whatever you are building for God's glory, Satan will see to it that you will face challenges coming at you from every direction. There is a being called Satan. He is real, and he's the sworn enemy of God, a fallen angel. In fact, the name Satan in Hebrew means adversary. Satan is God's permanent opponent. And because he hates God so much, he hates all people, because we are all made in God's image and likeness. And Satan especially hates people who align themselves with God, who would engage in God's work in our fallen world. Satan wants to keep this old world as messed up as possible. Satan loves rubble. And he loves exploiting the rubble in our lives. He's determined to oppose us anytime we engage with God in rebuilding our broken world. Restoring ruined lives brings great glory to God, so the devil will do all he can to demolish lives, to demolish marriages, to demolish families and churches and ministries and missions in order to try to rob God of the glory that he deserves. God's work in the world is always constructive. Satan's work in the world is always destructive. What God wants to build up, Satan wants to tear down. Satan's mission is to turn every construction site for God into his battleground. And in Nehemiah's day, Satan didn't want to see Jerusalem's broken walls go up again, and so he worked through people, through people in the surrounding area who also didn't want to see the walls be rebuilt. Now, Satan is not mentioned by name in the book of Nehemiah, but make no mistake, he is lurking behind the scenes in ancient Jerusalem. Satan is always lurking behind the scenes whenever any rebuilding project for God is taking place. He is working through human opponents to the wall project that are named in this chapter men like Sanballat, and Tobiah, and others. And the text in chapter 4 indicates how serious Satan is about sabotaging God's work amid the rubble of our fallen world. For the geographic origins of Nehemiah's enemies here reveal the devil's intent to surround Nehemiah and his workers with a ring of opposition. This was a neat uh, uh, observation this week. I'd never knew before, because you have to understand the geography uh, of the land to understand what's going on here. Verse 7, chapter 4, but when Sanballat, who was from Samaria, which is to the north of Jerusalem, Tobiah and the Arabs, which would have been south of Jerusalem, and the Ammonites from the, the territory of Ammon, east of Jerusalem, and the people of Ashdod, which were west from Jerusalem, Satan has marshaled people from every direction. Satan plans to come at God's people and their work from every conceivable angle. The north, the south, the east, and the west. And these people all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. It's no coincidence that opponents of God's work came at Nehemiah from every direction on the compass. Back then and still today, there is a sinister plot in the demonic realm to surround God's people with a ring of opposition whenever we attempt to build something for God's glory. Back in the early 80s, I attended an evangelism conference in Iowa, and uh, it was at a church, and the kind people of the church allowed those who were attending the conference to stay in their homes, and I happened to be assigned to a home in that little town in Iowa that, uh, where the backyard was on a hillside, kind of overlooking the, the local high school, and particularly the football field of the high school. 
And it was the fall time of the year. And I, after I got done with the afternoon session of the conference that day, I went back to the house. I had some reading assignments. I had some memorization assignments. And it was such a nice day outside. And I saw the football team after school practice. And I decided to get a chair and to go out and watch the team practice as I practice my evangelism. And I'm deep in thought about the gospel. And all once I hear, hey, what are you doing? And I look and there's this football coach coming up the side of the hill at me full bore. And I, 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 I'm so, what's going on? Well, you can imagine what he thought. They're down there practicing on the field, and they look up and see this guy sitting in a chair with a notebook watching them practice. He thought I was some rival football team coach that was scouting the opposition, and he didn't want their plays to be known. Satan also doesn't want us to be able to anticipate his moves. He doesn't want us to be aware of his favorite and most effective plays, but the Bible reveals them. Right here in Nehemiah 4 and 6, for instance, we get to see pages of Satan's playbook, how he likes to operate. And in our battles with Satan, here are some of the evil schemes that we need to expect and be ready for. By the way, that day with that coach, that was one of my most unique presentations of the gospel. He's coming up the hill, and I'm saying, here, look at this. This is the gospel. God loves you. Has a wonderful plan for your life. Yeah. He wasn't all that interested at that point. The first tactic of Satan illustrated here is verbal abuse. When we are building something for God, Satan will bring cheerleaders to mock us and to make fun of our work. Take a look at the first three verses of chapter 4. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. What are those feeble Jews doing? Now, feeble in Hebrew essentially means wimp. What are those wimps doing? They're pathetic. The text goes on in verse 3. Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side. Isn't it interesting how bullies embolden other bullies? What are they building? Well, look what they're building. Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their walls of stones. This wasn't true, of course. The walls were sturdy. They weren't flimsy. Uh, but he was making fun of their work. T Tobiah was saying what he wished were true. And one of the primary ways that Satan tries to discourage us from rebuilding what's broken in our lives and in our world is to coax other people to unleash a verbal barrage of hurtful words designed to demoralize us. Our enemy Satan is good at moving in people around us who will be happy to tell us how stupid we are to be a Christian how hopelessly out of touch our beliefs and our values and our standards are. Satan delights to line up a group of cheerleaders who in direct conversations with us or through TV and movie characters or in newspapers and magazines and books and internet websites, they, they attack the Christian view and they're eager to tell us that we ourselves and the rebuilding work we're doing in the world is completely crazy. Have you ever had anyone verbally attack you because of your Christian faith and because of your ministry mindset? Either explicitly or implicitly, have they declared that you're a kook? Satan is using their verbal venom to get you off the wall so that you'll stop rebuilding for God. Another play in Satan's playbook is targeting the top. When, we building, when we're building for something for God, Satan will try to distract or to eliminate our leaders. The opponents to the wall work in Jerusalem figured that if they could get Nehemiah away from his workforce, the labors of this leaderless people would grind to a halt. So at the beginning of chapter 6, they issued this courteously worded diplomatic invitation to Nehemiah. They said, why don't you come in and attend a top-level consultation on neutral ground? Come, Nehemiah, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. In fact, these connivers were trying to flatter Nehemiah, saying, Nehemiah, you're succeeding despite our opposition to your project, so it's no use for us to carry on our opposition. For better or worse, we're going to have to live together. So you as governor of Jerusalem and we as governors of our provinces, let's, let's be friends, and let's get together and talk about this. What we need is a summit conference, Nehemiah. But Nehemiah saw through their conspiracy. At best, they wanted to distract him and his team from their mission because the plain of Ono was a day or two journey from Jerusalem. And so counting the round trip and a day or two of meetings, Nehemiah would have, been, have to have been gone from the wall for the better part of a week. It would have stopped the momentum. But at worst, this was a plot to assassinate Nehemiah by getting him into an isolated place where he would be unprotected. 
See, these enemies were relentless in their attempt to separate Nehemiah, this invaluable leader, from his team. And they issued the same invitation to Nehemiah four times. If you're the leader of a ministry team, if you're the leader in your home, realize that Satan will try to distract you from the important work and the people who are counting on your leadership. Satan loves to devise, devise ways to divert the path of leaders, to entice them to waste time on unnecessary matters, or he will attempt to orchestrate circumstances that will make them vulnerable to a severe downfall. What I'm about to share with you is one of the more sobering things that, that we as pastors here at Village Church have had to face over the last year or so. And that is that we belong to the Missionary Church Denomination Central District, which is a group of about 60 churches in Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin. And in the last five and a half years, in the Central District of the Missionary Church, there have been several, 10 pastors who have fallen to sexual immorality. None of those pastors are here at Village Church. But we were in a meeting last week with our district superintendent and all the pastors of the district praying and talking, realizing that, no, the devil didn't make any of these guys do it. But you can be sure that the devil will work overtime, especially in the lives of Christian leaders, to get them enticed to whatever kinds of temptations because he knows that if they fall, the work of Christ will be affected in a significant way and the, the reputation of Christ will be damaged. I'll tell you what, if you want to pray for your leaders, if you want to pray for us as pastors, certainly pray for our work, but pray for our marriages. Pray for our moral purity. We're in a day and age where people are falling left and right. Satan doesn't get all the credit for that. We have some responsibility, but know that Satan likes to target the top. The third favorite play in Satan's playbook here is spreading rumors. When we are building something for God, Satan will maneuver people who question our integrity as Christians with damaging gossip and innuendo. When Nehemiah's opponents couldn't get him to join them away from the wall, they resorted to sending an unsealed letter, that is an open letter, a letter whose contents would eventually be known by everyone. It was addressed to Nehemiah, but it was intended to spread misinformation and false accusations that would become common knowledge uh, and, and arouse suspicions all around Jerusalem. You see parts of the letter there that stated, it's reported among the nations. Isn't that how gossip goes? I've heard reports. They say, uh, it's reported among the nations that, 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 uh, that, that this is going on. And Geshem says it's true. That's gossip too. Oh, I've heard them saying, and you know, so-and-so, they, 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 they've said it's true too. And what was the gossip? That you and the Jews, Nehemiah, are plotting to revolt. And therefore, that's why you're rebuilding the wall. Oh, they were rebuilding the wall to establish temple worship and get going again as the people of God. They didn't have any designs to, to some sort of subversive threat to try to, 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 be, to, to take over or over, you know, to, to fight against the king of Persia. But that's the gossip that was spread. Here's more of it. Moreover, the letter continues, according to the reports, Nehemiah, you're about to come, become king. That's why you're heading this wall project, so you can get the power and you can become the king, a rival king. And then Nehemiah had no such plans or aspirations, but the gossip was designed to stir up political trouble and shut down the construction. This reminds us here, folks, of one of Satan's favorite ploys, even today, in, in the church, in the Christian community, is to get rumors started inside and outside the Christian community that will get people to question the integrity of those who are simply trying to work with God to rebuild our broken world. And I say today, don't unwittingly become a tool that Satan uses to hinder or stop God's work by spreading or even believing accusations that are unverified. Satan laughs as gossip goes viral in the Christian community. And it spreads like an infection and it debilitates the work of rebuilding what's broken. Well, the fourth and final tactic of Satan that we will examine today is physical threats. When we're building something for God, 
Satan will at times marshal opponents for, well, for a violent attack. Chapter 4, verses 8 and 11. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. And also our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we're going to kill them and put an end to their work. Direct violent assault. These threats might have been empty. They may have been, were just merely scare tactics to intimidate the workers into giving up. For Nehemiah and the Jewish people had the king's permission and the resources to complete the project, but they couldn't be sure that they wouldn't be attacked, maybe ambushed with guerrilla warfare from time to time just to discourage them. And the Persian king and his army were a thousand miles away. It would take months for troops to arrive and protect them. So they're scared. Sometimes Satan will resort to violent assaults against God's people. And imagine having to work each day out there knowing that someone might be coming at you and trying to kill you. I think it's fitting that we're reminded of this on a Sunday in which prayer for the persecuted church around the world is encouraged. We already sang today, for still our ancient foe to seek to work us woe. His craft and his power are great, and he's armed with cruel hate. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, that's Satan's mission, to undo us. The song goes on, let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. You sang that today, do you believe it? Do you believe that even if opposition and persecution would come to America to the point where Christians are being killed, that everything's okay. We don't relish that, but everything's okay because even though they kill our bodies, they cannot kill our souls, and we would simply go sooner to the mighty fortress of heaven above. You know, there are many people around the world that face that kind of threat every day. We Americans are living in the historical oddity Hundreds of Christians around the world are martyred for their faith every day of the year. Did you hear that? Hundreds of Christians every day of the year, somewhere in the world, are martyred for their faith. And many others are ostracized from their families, physically abused, or imprisoned. And we American Christians have no idea the physical threats that our spiritual brothers and sisters face every day in other parts of the world. And we do need to pray for them. And we also need to thank God for the freedom that we currently enjoy. It is possible that someday, sooner than we might think, God will allow American Christians to, avert, uh, to, to endure this same overt and blatant kind of persecution that millions of Christians down through the centuries of church history have had to face. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. So we see that Satan has a variety of schemes in his playbook. And Nehemiah and his crew had to face at least four of them. Physical, uh, excuse me, verbal abuse, targeting leaders, spreading of rumors, and threats of physical assault. How did Nehemiah keep his construction crew working amid this relentless opposition? How did they manage to stay on the wall until it was successfully completed? Well, the Word of God here in Nehemiah's account of his experience reveals several effective countermeasures to all the opposition. And it's clear that the number one countermeasure is prayer. Does that surprise anyone here? It shouldn't. Nehemiah's godly leadership reminds us that prayer should always be our first resource and not our last resort. The book of Nehemiah contains several prayers that are intertwined and embedded within the account of the work that's going on and the opposition. Prayer was a vital component to the ongoing progress of this rebuilding project. And we see it in several places. When verbally abused, Nehemiah prayed. You know, when people mock you and make fun of your faith as a Christian, don't succumb to the tendency to react just like people of the world react. How do people of the world react when they're mocked and made fun of? They mock and make fun and ridicule right back. We shouldn't retaliate with zingers of our own. The Bible calls upon us to retaliate with prayer. Prayer for them and against their opposition. Don't take it out on them, but take it up to God in prayer. Our natural tendency when we're, when we're mocked is to say, well, I'll give them a piece of my mind. But the right response is to pray so that God can give you his peace in your mind. And when rumors spread, Nehemiah prayed. 
He told the rumor mongers, matter of fact, that the gospel was not true. You're making it up in your head. But then he immediately went vertical. He said, I- I'm just going to start praying for them. I'm going to pray for God's strength. And God, I'm going to leave my reputation in your hands despite the gossip. How do, you, how do you counter gossip? You pray. And when threatened physically, again, Nehemiah prayed. We're no match for Satan, but Satan is no match for God. And so talking to God and requesting this powerful intervention is the primary way that we resist the devil and get him to flee from us. Now, when you face opposition, do you pray as a last resort or as your first resource? Prayer should always be our primary countermeasure. Again, we sang today, did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Do you ask who that may be? Well, it's Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord of hosts is his name from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. Folks, that's why we pray. But while prayer was almost always Nehemiah's first instinct, he combined it with practical action. When the workers on the wall were taunted, they didn't just pray, they went back to work. Whatever anger Sambal and Tobiah had generated with their scoffing remarks, well, it only served to energize the labor gang, saying, well, if that's what those people think of us and our work, well, we'll show them we'll work even harder. And they focused all the more on the task at hand. When we get abused and make fun of, we should do this, pray harder, and just keep working harder. And when Satan tries to distract us from our work like that, uh, uh, like like he did Nehemiah, we should just say no. Nehemiah's opponents baited him to come off the wall and come to the plain of Ono for a meeting. Uh, uh, But Nehemiah responded, to the plain of Ono? Oh, no. In fact, Nehemiah sent messengers to the distractors with this polite but firm reply. I can't come. I'm I'm carrying on a great project for God, and I can't go down to the plain. Why should I stop working to come meet with you? Folks, we become effective as leaders and as workers in God's kingdom when we keep in mind the greatness of this project that God has given us, the opportunity to work in the greatest cause in the world, the only cause that will last forever, and we got to order our priorities. We need to understand what really matters and not get distracted by the petty things and the diversions that people will bring our way from rebuilding as God has given us the work to do. And then notice that when Nehemiah and his workforce were threatened with physical attacks, they didn't just pray to protect them, that, to ask God to protect them. That was important. But they also took practical steps to protect themselves. I love the balance of this verse, Nehemiah 4, nine. But we prayed to our God and posted guards day and night. Nehemiah trusted God to watch over his people, but he also put human sentries on duty to watch as well. And later on, he put families together at the, at the low and vulnerable points of the wall, and he told the people if they were attacked by an enemy army, folks, do two things. Remember the Lord and fight for your families. Scripture is so balanced. God is honored when we combine faith in him with a practical readiness to fight for the cause. It was the 17th century British military leader, Oliver Cromwell, who famously told his soldiers as they were about to go into battle, men, trust in God, but keep your gunpowder dry. When Nehemiah's enemies learned of his readiness for a surprise attack, the pressure of the opposition lessened, and Nehemiah was able to return the workers to work on the walls. But he was smart. He didn't dismiss the ongoing possibility of an ambush. And for the rest of the project, Nehemiah turned Jerusalem into an armed camp. Look at chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. These are the last verses we'll look at this morning. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears and bows and armor. The officers posted themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. And those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders who who were working on the wall wore his sword at his side as he worked. Ingenious. There were two shifts now, the building shift and the battling shift. And even those on the building shift were armed. The people wisely carried tools and weapons. They were, well, they were equipped and they were ready to build and to battle. This is the enduring lesson for us today, I think, from the book of Nehemiah. You need to realize, as they did, that if you're building something for God, you always got to be prepared, be prepared to battle at the same time that you build. 
If you are resolving to rebuild your marriage and some of the broken aspects of it, all expect Satan to come in and give you a battle. If you, resolve, if, you, if you resolve to rebuild your prayer life or to say, I'm going to start reading the Bible more, expect a battle. If you decide to come to the worship services every Sunday instead of only sporadically, Satan will see to it that all sorts of issues and opportunities will come up to divert your path. Expect a battle. If you commit to participating in a small group or serving in a ministry or reaching out into your neighborhood with the love of Christ, expect a battle. That's the last thing Satan wants to see happen. Nobody ever said that building something for God would be easy. God's construction sites always become Satan's battlegrounds. But in closing, why does God allow Satan to turn construction sites into battlegrounds? Why does God make us as his people build and battle at the same time? Well, consider Nehemiah and his crew. I think after the pressures and the opposition started coming in on them, they were no doubt more earnest, they were more unified, they were more alert because it was crunch time. It's the same reason that 35% of all points scored in an NFL football game take place, you know when? After the two-minute warning of each half. Crunch time. And in ancient Jerusalem, with only half the workforce working, the other half were able to rest up while on guard duty. And therefore, I think the workforce was rejuvenated for those final weeks of the work. They could enter the final stages of the work project. They could work longer hours with increased output because they were working part of the time and watching and guarding part of the time. Shift work probably enabled them to finish with a strong final kick instead of burning out. God always has his reasons, folks, for allowing us to face pressures and opposition because he's going to bring good out of that bad situation for his glory. You know, a man found a cocoon of an emperor moth and he took it home because he wanted to watch this moth emerge. And one day a small opening appeared, and for several hours the moth struggled, but it couldn't seem to force his body past a certain point. And deciding that something was wrong, the man took a scissors, and he snipped open the remaining bit of cocoon. And the moth emerged easily. In fact, the moth fell out of the cocoon, its body large and swollen, the wings small and shriveled. And the man expected that in a few hours the wings would spread out in their natural beauty, but they didn't. Instead of developing into a creature that was free to fly, that moth spent its life dragging around a swollen body and shriveled wigs. You see, in God's design, the constricting cocoon and the struggle to pass through that tiny opening was God's way of forcing fluid from the body into the wings. And that man's merciful snip was in reality cruel because God knows that sometimes the struggle is exactly what we need. In order to develop into the people that God has in mind for us to be, we should always expect to be building and battling at the same time. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? God, again, we thank you for the privilege you've given us to be involved with you in setting the world aright. Now that you've set our lives aright through Jesus, what a privilege it is to join you in this great cause of rebuilding what's broken. And yet, Lord, forgive us for our naivete of thinking that when we follow God, everything's going to be easy. On the contrary, the more we follow you and get involved in rebuilding your broken world, the more Satan is going to battle us. And God, I pray today that you would cause the people of Village Church to remain strong. We have some internal battles with fatigue and frustration and feelings of failure at times, but there's these, also these external battles as Satan te seeks to just really tear down the work that you're trying to do in and through us. And God, we pray that we would focus on you and what's really important, and that we would keep the full armor that you've provided us, and that we would wield the sword of the Spirit so that we can fight in your strength for your victory and for your glory. Anyone, Lord, who is struggling today, may they know that you love them, and the struggles themselves are a sign that you are at work. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we close.